Good evening, everyone. And my name is Belle Ribeiro Adi. I'm the Labour MP for Streatham. And I'm really pleased to welcome you to this important online discussion on the next steps for Labour's Left, hosted by Arise a festival of Labour's left ideas and supported by a number of groups, including the Labour Assembly Against Austerity. This event couldn't be more timely as we face a government which needs to take more urgent action to save lives when it comes to the coronavirus. We've also seen the upset and anger in our party at the contents of the recently leaked report. Tonight we'll be discussing these issues and more and our next key steps as socialists in the Labour Party. There's been such an amazing level of interest in this event that despite the technical difficulties we are forging ahead um, all of our speakers and we've got a fantastic line of speakers will be speaking for seven minutes each and hopefully we'll be able to take a round of questions at the end due to some parliamentary business tonight some of our speakers may need to pop in and out so please be patient with us especially as this is actually our first online arise event so our speakers are i'm going to introduce our first speaker actually our first speaker is ian lavery uh, the Member of Parliament for Wandsbeck. Ian. Good, Hi. thank you very much. How you, how's things? Not bad. Good, well listen, there's a message. And the message quite simply is, we've had a dismal few weeks, but listen, we had a fantastic four or five years under Jeremy Corbyn, didn't we? And the message to people is, quite simply, don't mourn, organise. You know, when you look at what the government <clears throat> are doing as we actually speak on this call tonight, I might get criticised for this, but it looks like to, to me as if the government um, are employing herd immunity against our people. We've seen Boris Johnson return uh, to number 10 this morning. You know what? He came to the Commons this morning <clears throat> to take back control. Where have we heard that before? Take back control. Does that mean to say that the government actually have lost control, have never been in control of this pandemic in the first place? And the first thing that Johnson said was, You'll be amazed at how people would look and are looking at the success uh, Britain is having with this coronavirus. What success? And he had the nerve to come in front of the cameras and say that to the country today in his first outing since he, he, he's had this uh, bout of coronavirus. I think it's atrocious. I think it's out of touch. That's only uh, a sign of things to come within the Conservative Party. And what happened just before we come on air? There was an announcement by the government that people, NHS workers and carers who die, who've died and who die in service will get £60,000 compensation. What an absolute outrage. £60,000 for somebody's life. £60,000 for your mother. £60,000 for your dad or your grand or your brother or your sister. And this is why people need to stay within the Labour Party. This is why we don't mourn, we organise. Because this is a way people are being threat in the darkest of times. And what we will see in the very near future, by the way, is this huge move to break down the lockdown because the economy is failing. And will there be a choice to save the economy or save people's lives? And to be quite honest, we've seen the situation where the government haven't even got the ability to supply the correct PPE to people working on the front line, trying to save those most vulnerable in society. This is why we do it more and we organise, because this will be over at some time. And we've got a duty to meet the challenge we have before us. 
We don't walk away as, as socialists. We don't shirk our responsibilities. We pick up that cudgel and fight not for ourselves, but for others. It's a fight for a fairer society, for a decent society, where we're all seen as equals and all threat as equals as well. So we don't walk away, we don't mourn, we organise, because after coronavirus is gone, after it is a memory, we, uh, it's, it's, it's a, a, a mass movement, they've got to make sure we put pressure on this government so we don't see a return to austerity too. Because that's what the Tories will do. Never mind the, the, the fact that they're clapping outside Downing Street and millions of people are clapping at the doorsteps of the NHS for carers, for key workers, for essential workers. That'll be forgotten in two minutes flat. It'll be we need to repair the economy, we need to tighten our belts, and those key workers, those migrant workers, those zero hour contract workers, those part A workers, those people who've been cast aside, the public sector workers who've been cast aside, haven't even been afforded a pay rise for years and years and years, will be the subject of further uh, cuts themselves into their personal budgets. That's what will happen, by the way. So we don't walk away. We organise, and we've got to make sure that we organise to ensure that the party is in a much better place um, to, 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 to attack the government. And I mean attack the government. I'm not for this. I welcome what the, uh, the health secretary says, or I welcome what the home secretary says, or I welcome... Listen, we should be holding this government here to account for the atrocious way the atrocious fashion which they uh, looked and they have tackled, or the lack of that, uh, the, the coronavirus, herd immunity, that's what I'll say. So we need to be looking. Look at the people who are now the key workers. Look at the people who the government are praising. The doctors and nurses, the ancillary workers, the carers, the dustbin men, the fire and rescue service, the police. The delivery workers, the supermarket workers, the public sector workers, the council workers. Until this coronavirus thing kicked off, these people were stamped on by this government. They were held back by this government. And that has got to change. So, what have all these people got in common? The people I've mentioned, but all being under austerity's severest push. The councils of police, the public sector, fire and rescue, NHS have all been hit by a decade of cuts. It's, it's right to say the people who have been most deprived are the ones who suffered the hardest, and we cannot allow that to continue. And what we have experienced, strangely enough, we've experienced socialism right across the UK on a scale we've never known before. Just the simple things where people actually do care for each other, where people do uh, whatever they can to help those worst off and those needy in society because cooperation and mutual support really are the roots of the British national culture. So we've got to look ahead. We've got to look to rebuild society. We've got to reshape society, rebuild and reshape the services which we all need to survive. We've got to create an NHS service integrated with social care, with the right investment, with the right rates of pay, with the right yeah, the right. PPE with the right medication, with the right environment. We've got to make sure that we have the right investment because what we've seen in the NHS in the last few weeks is 10 years of austerity. And that's why we are actually on one knees. We need to come forward with workers' rights, protecting everybody who I've just mentioned and everybody who works. Get rid of the zero hour contracts. 
to ensure that people are paid correctly. And I'll tell you what, the minimum wage isn't enough for these key workers to get following this pandemic. The people in the city are still making fortunes. The people in the financial institutions who we can do without aren't the key workers in this nation. We need to look at workers' rights and ensure that people are paid correctly. We need to look at the poverty levels. That's 24%, just announced this morning, 24% children living in poverty in my constituency. We've got to look after the homeless. We've got to ensure we've got secure jobs. We've got to ensure that the communities are fully serviced. We've got to ensure that we learn from this and we have a new economy for a new age. Let me tell you, comrades, the Tory party, I'm not about that. It'll be back to business as usual. Austerity, the brutal kind, following coronavirus. That's why, despite what we've learned in the last few days, perhaps with the, the leaks from the Labour Party, perhaps we, we, we need to learn from that. And obviously, we're in despair at the fact that we could have actually been in government in 2007. 17, if indeed the people at the very top of the party machine have been supporting the Labour Party and not wanting a Tory victory. It could have been also very much different had we have had the support of those who we heavily relied on in 2017. 2,400 votes more and we could have been in Downing Street. What a difference we could have made. The comrades, it's all to fight for. It really is. And it's to fight for. Do not mourn. Organise. Let's strengthen the left. Let's strengthen the Labour Party and get in there and make a difference for all these people who are on the front line at this moment of time and all those people in this <laughs> wonderful society of ours. Solidarity. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Don't moan. Organise. Yes. Um, Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm going to move on quickly to our next speaker, Grace Blakely, um, who I'm sure you all know, writer, economist and campaigner. Grace, are you on the call? Hey, Belle. How are you doing? Hi. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Good. Not bad, thank you. Bye. <laughs> so, ready when you are, Grace? Great. Um, okay, so, yeah. Um, I guess I'm going to talk a little bit about um, when the historical context of the Labour left, because I think a lot of maybe the people who joined the Labour Party um, in 2015 to support Jeremy Corbyn, um, and indeed a lot of people observing it, will have seen what happened, you know, the astonishing rise to power um, of Jeremy Corbyn and uh, developments in the Labour Party after that, kind of it, a very historically unique situation, knowing the Labour Party as they did, as it had been for many, many years, as um, a kind of vehicle for uh, the largely liberals rather than, than socialists. And actually, now we know some quite vehement anti-socialists at the very heart of that party. But actually, uh, I, I kind of want us to, um, as a movement now, to kind of contextualise the last four years a much longer history of the Labour left and therefore um, kind of learn um, that, you know, there is cause for optimism and that actually we are today part of a much longer struggle that is going to continue for a very, very long time. And that, you know, we have a, a responsibility and a, a duty to maintain, as Ian said, to keep um, as a part of that struggle if we are. Um, socialists and our committed to this to this cause, you know, as Tony then famously said, that the the quote um, that was constantly trotted out after the election victory, you know, there is no final victory, just as there is no final defeat. That was based on years and years of bitter experience uh, from those organising the Labour left, you know, throughout the post war period. So we must see ourselves as kind of part of that um, of that history. And in that context, you know, Corbynism uh, kind of comes out in quite a historically unusual situation because the parliamentary Labour left has historically kind of been backed up and bolstered by a set of um, social forces in society that were often stronger than the left was in the Labour Party. Um, and uh, we had a kind of Labour movement that was in many ways much, much stronger uh, at certain points in history than was um, 
the Labour left within the party um, and the kind of uh, um, coordination between progressive forces in society, you know, community institutions, that party that focused on electoral politics was a real source of, of strength for social. Now, the Corbyn came to power um, for a whole number of reasons you know, to do with uh, Thatcher's frustration, the Labour movement, the kind of widespread individualism associated with neoliberalism that had kind of eroded the social capital that uh, underpinned those kind of community organisations, the breaking off of various different social movements to fight their various different causes. Um, all of this uh, had led to the kind of fracturing of the left before, before Corbyn. And, you know, at that point, very, very few people imagined what would happen. But of course, in uh, the theme for all the reasons that we know, we had this amazing resurgence of socialism within the Labour Party. Now, what's interesting about that when you look back on it is that, you know, rather than having, as perhaps was the case in the past, the Labour movement and the unions stronger and more radical and more active than the Parliamentary Labour Party, um, in the uh, 16, we had an electoral left that in many ways Kind of stronger and more active than the rest of the left. And um, James Schneider has an article in a book that I have coming out with Verso, very interestingly called Teachers of Socialism, where he talks about how, and James Schneider has worked as a uh, Jeremy Corbyn communications director, he talks about how the task for the Labour Party as a Corbyn was to bridge this gap between the strength of uh, the electoral forces of the left and the relative weakness of the wider social forces. And this was a really quite difficult task. Um, for you know, many reasons that, that I've just said, the Labour movement had gone into a, a period of, of um, quite steep decline after Thatcherism, you know, partly because of the direct uh, onslaught led by Thatcher, firstly against uh, the miners and then against the rest of the Labour movement as a whole and the anti-trade union legislation introduced, partly because of the changing nature of work, you know, for a whole number of reasons. Um, the Labour movement uh, wasn't as strong in 2016 as perhaps it had been um, compared to the parliamentary left in the past. Then you had all these kind of wider social movements that had become more prominent as protest groups during that time that the Labour left was um, kind of in the wilderness, as it were, and the left as a whole was kind of less focused on electoralism. So getting them kind of back and coherent them around a, 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 an electoral political project was very difficult. Um, we had, you know, uh, the, the Labour Party was underpinned um, in the past by a, a huge number of kind of uh, like locally rooted community organisations, you know, working men's clubs, all these sorts of things that provided an organic link between the party and communities. And all these, you know, again, because of that individualization that was associated with um, the, the decline in social capital under, under neoliberalism, those things that it had eroded quite substantially. And this had an effect in a number of different ways. Um, so, you know, it, it was common to hear after the, the general election of 2019 that um, the Labour Party kind of lost touch with the community that it was supposed to represent. And, you know, hear people talk about that in any number of different ways. But really, that was a process that had started to take place. There's a book by Jeff Evans and James Tiley called uh, The New Politics of Class, The Political Disenfranchisement of the British Working Classes. And they look at how actually working class participation in politics started to decline from 1997 onwards. So this, this engagement between uh, working class communities and the Labour Party has been taking place for a very, very long time. And the kind of relative weakness of the social forces that were supposed to be rooted in those communities certainly didn't help. Another issue was a kind of lack of political education. So we had all these amazing, inspiring, exciting new members coming in, hundreds of thousands of them but there wasn't really the mechanisms within the party or actually outside the party in places like Momentum to cohere them into a more organized and strong political force that was aware of its, its mission, both within and outside of the Labour Party. Um, so, you know, slowly, Corbynism was always about kind of building back um, and trying to put in place the processes, the organizational, the institutional capacity necessary to bridge that gap between the relative weakness of, of social forces and the strength of the electoral left. And a lot of progress was made. Um, you know, we've always got now the community organizing network, the labor movement has uh, become stronger certainly within the Labour Party. And, you know, there's certainly been a lot of high profile strikes that have been going on recently as, you know, Corbynism has helped to kind of boost that sense of, of, uh, of class consciousness and resistance to, uh, to neoliberalism. 
Um, we've also, uh, obviously, have, we have Momentum now, which is a kind of pan-active, you know, it's a lot of problems, but could act as a voice for the, the left within the Labour Party. Um, and we've got things like the World Transformed, which have provided a really important resource for political education. And obviously, a rise, Labour Assembly Against Austerity, all the various Labour for campaigns. All of this infrastructure exists now that simply didn't before Corbyn came to power. So, you know, in so many ways, we have such such reason to be um, optimistic. And we need to really build on what we have, make sure we can carry on bridging these gaps, you know, this gap. We need to use the time that we have now to build the left in the rest of society, whilst also defending the gains that we've made within the Labour Party. Uh, and now there are a couple of few ways that I think you know we need to we need to do this, a few kind of resources that we need to rely on. I think one important thing um, is that you know momentum has because of the re because like we, the left was constantly in campaigning mode throughout the whole of, of Corbyn's leadership. Really, I mean, first you had the first leadership election, then the second leadership election, and the coup. Obviously, we now know that there was a constant battle going on within the Labour Party. Uh, you obviously had the European Union referendum. You had local elections. You had two two actual general elections. So momentum was in many ways pushed from something that perhaps could have helped to organise much more within the Labour Party and in communities into something that would basically campaign for, um, for Corbyn and for, and for Labour, which is useful at the time, but it means that it hasn't developed into something much broader and much deeper. And I think, um, you know, the upcoming NTG elections are going to be really important there. We need to make sure we have a kind of united left that represents the whole of the left within and outside the Labour Party and that is united in its ambition to build the strength and the power of the left within Labour, whilst also, um, whilst also kind of building up, uh, building up campaigns in, in the rest of society. And, and so you know, that is going to be really, really important. We can't afford to have factionism anymore. We're not strong enough. We need to make sure that we have a, a united state for that. And of course, even more importantly, for the NEC election, because we saw what happened uh, when we had uh, we had kind of fractions there um, in in the leadership election for the NEC, and that was a, a real tragedy that we did get some some great left voices onto the NEC there. Um, and what I think that could act as if you get it right is a resource for political education. Um, so doing that kind of um, you know situating our current movement in the context of a much longer, as I said, uh, um, movement within, within the Labour Party as, as part of a much longer tradition within the Labour left uh, and uh, educating people about organising, about policy, about lots of different things um, in the way that like, the world transform does, but in a, in a much more organised way, perhaps using tools that we now learn to use much better over the course of this crisis. Um, it also act, uh, starts with much more community organising and, as I said, working within the Labour Party uh, to act as a coherent voice for the left to make sure that the amazing policies that we have fought so hard for over the last four years are not abandoned when they are needed more than ever. Policies like the Green New Deal, which is so, so popular amongst the electorate, you know, we need to make sure we are fighting for that now so that we can say, right, end of this crisis, we're not going back to austerity. We are using this moment to rebuild our economy and decarbonize it so that crisis, crises like this don't become a constant feature of a, uh, of a, 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 a world beset by, um, by climate crisis. Um, so we really need to make sure we're organizing within Labour to defend those policy gains, but also to deepen the timid steps that were made towards the the Labour Party itself. Now, as we've seen, the tiny cabal of the sort of left now, and um, that uh, still it's not good enough to have a party that's supposed to be run and represent, be run by and represent members, being run largely by a kind of bureaucratic machine, which is why it's so important for us to take steps towards further democratisation within the Labour Party. Members need to be the ones that are making and pushing for policies. Um, and we've, we've taken steps towards that. You know, the Labour 4 campaigns, as I said, were a great example of that. Um, but we've got much further to go as well. Um, as well as momentum, we also need to, we've got a couple of members here, many members here of, of the SCG, the Socialist Campaign Group uh, of MPs within the Labour Party. 
um, which is a really important source of, of leadership, I think, in the, the coming uh, months and years ahead. You know, we're going to need voices in Parliament to stand up and to, yes, challenge the Tories, but also, where necessary, challenge Keir Starmer if he is abandoning those policies that are so popular with the membership. So I think, you know, supporting the SDG um, and uh, perhaps, you know, increasing the links implementing the SDG is also going to be important. As well as, finally, you know, this is a really critical thing that we can all do immediately, getting everyone much more involved in their CLPs and building a proper, you know, movement that exists from the very ground up and figuring out ways you're getting involved in your CLP, figuring out ways you can do political education, figuring out ways you can get involved in your wider community and slowly starting to rebuild those links that have historically formed the foundation of, uh, of the left's power, both within the party and wider society. You know, there's so much on that list that we have to do, but we also have now the time to, as I said, kind of bridge that gap between the, what was the strength of the Labour Party electorally and what was the relative weakness of, of wider social forces. Um, and you know, whilst to an extent we lost a little bit of that electoral power, um, we now have the capacity to kind of try our best through organising to maintain support for the policies that were developed under Corbyn, but also to build out of left power in wider society and actually start to uh, really kind of promote um, a sense of, of solidarity, of, of class consciousness, which is so, so important for the adoption of, uh, of socialist policies. And in many ways, we're going to be seeing this happen anyway, because that individualism that underpinned neoliberalism um, is, is being eroded very strongly by this crisis, uh, because we are slowly starting to realise that we're all connected, that, you know, we can't each you know, go out on our own and we're not just kind of individuals bumping up against one another in a free market. We are part of a society and we depend on one another. And the solidarity that has emerged in response to this crisis has been incredible and has vindicated what socialists have been saying for a very, very long time, which is that you know, we need to care for one another. We need to build a society that is based on this principle of solidarity that is so uh, central to the labor movement. So to sum up, don't despair. We are building on a, a long history that came before us. And uh, as Tony Benn would have said, there is no final victory as there is no final defeat. So we all need to toughen up. Thank you, Grace. Thank you very much. It's a per perfect note to end on. <laughs> and also definitely touching on the fact that we need to protect the policies that we've been able to put um, to the forefront of the party over the past few years. Those have been so important and, and we saw just how, um, how much they resonated with not just our members, but people across the country. So we've got a job of work to do, but we're gonna do it. And we're gonna move on to our next uh, speaker, Richard Bergen, Member of Parliament for Leeds East, who's also the Secretary of the Socialist Campaign Group of MPs. Richard, are you on the line? I am, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Lovely. Uh, hi, I'm going to try without the earphones in. Let me just see. Is, is that slow okay or is there any feedback yeah. or anything? No, it's all good. That's fine. Splendid, you can hear me. Um, well, I'm delighted to join this uh, discussion. I've had some uh, difficulties uh, in the chamber, some uh, technological difficulties zooming into the House of Commons chamber. Sorry to disappoint people, I wouldn't have been dressed up just to speak to Grace Bell and Ian and all of you tonight. I'm dressed up because it was a requirement of making a speech in the finance bill earlier. Uh, Ian's not impressed. Uh, I would feel a bit sad getting into a, a suit and tie just to go into my own kitchen. It would be a bit of a sad uh, life that I uh, live. But I was pleased to hear uh, Grace's contribution earlier. And she's completely right in what she's saying, uh, in that the coronavirus crisis unmasks the results, not only of 10 years of austerity, from the Conservatives, but also 40 years of the domination of neoliberal economics and marketization. And so as we make the case for a new kind of society, we need to be clear that the free market and the hidden hand of the market doesn't have any of the solutions to the problems faced by humanity, whether that's in relation to the public health crisis, or whether that's in relation to the very likely, as it stands, uh, economic and social crisis that's going to follow hot on the heels of that uh, public health crisis. 
So we do need to think, what kind of society do we want to create from the ashes of the coronavirus crisis? And that leads me, of course, to the question of the kind of society that we would have been in government building had it not been for the fact that we didn't win the 2017 and 2019 general election. I've spoken previously at meetings of what I considered to be the sabotage by many members, regrettably, of the Parliamentary Labour Party when they managed in 2016 to turn what was a Conservative crisis in the aftermath of the EU referendum results, they managed to turn that Conservative crisis into a crisis for Labour. But we now see, with the recent reports uh, and the recent leaked uh, report, that there are real allegations that alongside the sabotage by members of the Parliamentary Labour Party, there are now serious allegations of a sabotage operation by people working for the Labour Party at a very high level. Level. And this isn't an internal matter. This isn't about naval gazing, because the challenges that we're facing now as a society and would be facing now, even without the coronavirus crisis, would be challenges which we would have been tackling in government, because we were only, the analysis shows, two and a half thousand votes right across the country, short of winning that 2017 general election. So when it comes to that report, I understand that the allegations in that report, not only of top officials allegedly scuppering Labour's chances of winning that general election and deliberately doing so, but also there's a case to answer when it comes to racism, sexism, bullying and harassment. I understand that upsets Labour Party members. And of course, it does. They were out there in all weathers, being called all names under the sun by newspapers like The Sun, campaigning for a Labour victory. And to find out that there are allegations that people who should have been working for them and for millions of voters across the country weren't doing so is, of course, truly heartbreaking. But what I would say is that it would be a mistake to leave the Labour Party as a result of that. Because if you leave the Labour Party because of the allegations in that leaked report, then that actually is a reward for the kind of behaviour that is alleged in that report. And the kind of people who never wanted a socialist to lead the Labour Party, who never wanted a socialist prime minister, would be absolutely cock-a-hoop and delighted if, as a result of these allegations, left-wing members of the Labour Party leave our Labour Party. So we can't do that. But also, we need to face some realities of being involved in political struggle. If it's the case that the allegations in this report are true, if it's the case that there was an operation at the heart of the Labour Party bureaucracy, if you like, to scupper the chances of getting a Labour government, then I'm afraid in the history of progressive socialist movements in this country and around the world, that wouldn't be anything particularly new. Just take a look, for example, at the miners' strike. Read if you get chance, and if you haven't already, Seamus Milne's book on the miners' strike and the aftermath. Look at the allegations about Roger Windsor, who was chief of staff, I believe, or something uh, akin to that, uh, at the National Union of Mine Workers. And allegations were made, which are taken seriously by very many people, that he was actually working for the state in order to ensure that the miners didn't win that dispute. So at home and abroad, whenever there is a socialist working class movement that's able to achieve real change, you can bet your bottom dollar that there will be attempts to destabilize, attempts to sabotage and all the rest of it. And the only way to be part of a progressive movement that doesn't have attempts of sabotage and destabilization is to be involved in a progressive movement that has no chance of changing society. The reason that the National Union of Mine Workers was subjected to destabilization and sabotage during the miners' strike was because the establishment realized that the miners could win that miners' strike and by doing so, change society for the better and change the balance of power in society. In the same way, 
they knew that there was a real possibility they would get a socialist as the prime minister of this country, but not just a socialist in terms of economic policy, but also an anti-war internationalist, also an anti imperialist as the prime minister of a country with a permanent seat on the United Nations Security Council. These things are no trifling matters. So if it turns out that reports and allegations of sabotage were true, then it would be no surprise to me because it's a story that's been written again and again in the history of our movements. And as Grace has just said at the end of her contribution, we need to toughen up in the words of Tony Benn, and accept that these things are an inevitable part of the struggle when you're threatening the establishment and the system, the unequal system that it uh, is seeking to uphold. When it comes to defeats for the left, again, I understand that left-wing members are disappointed that neither the left-wing candidate for leader of the Labour Party nor the left-wing candidate for deputy leader won in those internal party elections. I understand that some of our fantastic new comrades who maybe joined in 2015 or not long after aren't used to losing internal elections. Some of the rest of us have got used to it uh, over uh, many years. Hopefully we won't be losing too many more internal elections. But people need to understand that the road to a socialist leadership, the road to a socialist government is certainly often a rocky one. And the left has faced many defeats in the past in our Labour Party. And Nairon Bevan, for example, who was the leader of the left was expelled from the Labour Party for six months whilst he was a Labour MP and the undisputed leader of the left in the Labour Party. If all the left-wing members who were heartbroken at that had left at the time, then what would have happened? They didn't leave, and what happened was that six months later, Aniron Bevan was let back into the Labour Party. Just a few years later, he became the cabinet minister that set up our National Health Service, built all those council houses, and eventually became deputy leader of our Labour Party. I remember, for example, when Ian Lavery was selected as a Labour Party candidate in his constituency. At that time, it was rather unusual for people with Ian's proud socialist politics to be selected in constituencies like that. And then a few years later, I was selected in my home constituency. Again, it was unusual for someone at the time with overt left politics like me to be selected in such a strong Labour seat. But that was because trade unionists and left-wing Labour members had worked very hard to get socialist candidates selected for Parliament. And if they hadn't, if they'd have given up when they were disappointed through the Blair years at various betrayals, then what would have happened? What would have happened is there wouldn't have been sufficient members of Parliament to get Jeremy Corbyn even on the ballot paper in 2015. Not only wouldn't he have been the leader of the Labour Party, he wouldn't have been able to be a candidate for the Labour Party. And I think if people like Diane, if people like Jeremy and John McDonnell, if people like all the members, rank and file members we know across the country, could stay in our Labour Party after Tony Blair unforgivably supported George Bush's invasion and occupation of Iraq, then so can all of you, I hope, stay in the Labour Party if you're disappointed that Becky didn't become leader, if you're disappointed that I didn't become deputy leader, and if you're heartbroken about the allegations uh, in that report. And the left has a crucially important role to play in the Labour Party and more widely as well. There's going to be a huge battle of ideas that takes place, and the left has to play a real role in that. There's going to be a huge challenge to organise effectively for the left. And I want everybody listening into this call to play a role in that. Um, Grace mentioned earlier the National Executive Committee elections. It's not just a cliche to say that unity is strength. What we need to do is ensure that the different left groups work together and have discussions in an atmosphere of mutual respect in order to get a unified ticket of candidates to put forward in the upcoming NEC elections. Because if we do, 
I believe we can win as a left those National Executive Committee elections, particularly when people are so offended by the allegations in that report. And I think if we get a team of candidates together who the members across the country recognise will articulate their anger and will be on their side, I think there's every chance of them winning and there's every chance, therefore, of there being a left majority on the National Executive Committee. And I think that is something that we really uh, should be, as a left, focusing on. That Leeds United Cup, by the way, is the second thing that's going to offend Ian. Bell doesn't seem to be offended, so I'm pleased. I'm pleased Bell's not uh, uh, offended by the Leeds United uh, mug. But a point I did want to address was the fact that the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs uh, was mentioned earlier. Um, Bell is the uh, co-chair of the Socialist Campaign Group. Uh, Ian Lavery is a long-standing member of the Socialist uh, Campaign Group of Labour MPs. And I do think the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs, as the organised Benites and Corbynite left within the Parliamentary Labour Party, has a very important role to play. Many new members, understandably, won't necessarily be aware of the history of the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs. It was set up in December 19. 82 as a split from the Tribune group when some of the left MPs uh, like Dennis Skinner and like Joan Maynard and others were disappointed that members of the Tribune group didn't support Tony Benn's candidature to be deputy leader of the Labour Party. And ever since 1982, the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs has been the organised group of Benite uh, Labour members of parliament within the Parliamentary Labour Party. It's always argued for more party democracy, such as open selections. It's always argued for socialist economic policies. It's always argued and for and stood with oppressed minorities in this country and around the world. And it's always spoken out against war and against imperialism. It's going to continue uh, in that vein. We've had some fantastic additions to the Social Campaign Group of Labour MPs since 2019. It was heartbreaking to lose people like Laura Pidcock, who was uh, the co-chair, people like Karen Lee, uh, people... Uh, like uh, Laura Smith uh, and, of course, Dennis Skinner. But it's fantastic that new members like Bell uh, joined our ranks. And when people ask me what's the aim and objective of the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs, I'll say our aims most moderate are. Our aims are merely to be no more and no less than as influential as the progress group was in the mid 1990s. I think that's something to aim for. And I think it's really important that the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs works with left members, trade unions and campaigns across the country. And so what we've recently launched is a sign-up page for our forthcoming e-newsletter, where we'll keep you in touch uh, with the group, uh, the work that the uh, group's doing. I remember when I was younger, I used to order Socialist Campaign Group news. It used to come through my letterbox four or five times a year. We're going to get back to that kind of thing uh, with uh, an e-newsletter. Uh, so organisation is required. The battle of ideas uh, is required. Obviously, Parliament is only one arena of struggle. The picket line, the protest, the discussions in the communities are also a crucial, uh, a crucial uh, place. And I say again, don't feel downhearted as a left member. When I consider my own deputy leadership uh, campaign, I think we can take some encouragement from that. That was a campaign which was overtly left and overtly Benite and overtly Corbynite in the kind of policies that it was proposing. And we came second in the first round with the votes of over 80,000 people. And as one of the volunteers said, that means there's as many left-wing members of the Labour Party as could fill Wembley Stadium. Prior to 2015, I have to say, the idea of there being 80,000 plus Labour members prepared to vote in a leadership or deputy leadership election for a programme as overtly left-wing as that would have seemed a pipe dream. So whilst it's disappointing that Becky didn't win and I didn't win from a left perspective, 
obviously we're working to get care into uh, number 10, but obviously we need to analyse the fact that as a left, despite the fact that the left candidates didn't win in those internal elections, the left is in a far stronger position than it was uh, before 2015. And we need to recognise that. We need to defend the socialist policies in our last two manifestos. I said during my deputy leadership campaign that whoever became leader of the Labour Party, they didn't have a mandate to ditch a single socialist policy without the express permission, the express democratic permission of Labour's members. And I believe that. And we need to build upon the policies in that manifesto because there are already people seeking to use a coronavirus crisis to reshape society in the wrong way. We've already heard the Chancellor saying that this bill will need to be accounted for after the public health crisis is over. People only need to read uh, Disaster Capitalism by Naomi Klein to understand what the establishment is prepared to do during uh, and in the aftermath of such a crisis. So in our way, we must see that. And what we must do is on the side of people who have been made to suffer unnecessarily, we must put forward the humane, compassionate, reasonable, evidenced arguments for a better society. If we'd have won that 2017 general election, a national care service would exist. If we'd have won that general election, the national health service would be in a far better position. If we'd have won that general election, tenants would be in a far stronger position. And all of these things need to be considered. We need to defend those socialist policies, but also move on and move forward. And I believe as an organized left, we can do that. We've got the ideas collectively, we've got the organizations collectively, and I think we've got a real potential, a real potential to play a vital role in shaping, shaping the way Labour gets into government, ensuring that Labour can get into government, and ensuring that when we do get into government, the kind of policies that we're introducing the kind of policies set out in the 2017 and 2019 manifesto. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm, I'm going to move straight into some of the questions that some people have got in, give you guys a chance to get back um, to them. The first one I've got is, how do you think we can learn from what happened in the response to the 2008 financial crash in the next few weeks and months in terms of responding to this crisis. Can I, can I ask you, Grace? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, there's a huge amount that we can learn from the response to 2008. Uh, this crisis is going to dwarf, obviously, the scale of 2008 on so many levels. Uh, but what we did see was that in 2008, the state was willing and able to take extreme measures in order to stabilize the economic and financial system. And the reason it did that, of course, was that at that point, it was in the interests of the wealthy, of big business, of big banks, for the state to do that. People who have been arguing for decades that the state needed to play uh, less of a role in regulating financial markets, impose fewer taxes, reduce regulation, etc., uh, were suddenly at you know, the door of number 10 begging for bailouts or uh, whatever else. And the same exact same thing is happening um, today. You know, Richard Branson, um, who, you know, threatened to sue the NHS over not getting a particular contract for his private care homes, is now begging the government for a bailout. The airline industry, which has created so much uh, chaos and havoc uh, in the climate, is potentially getting a kind of secret bailout that we're not even going to hear about. Yeah. Um, there are, you know, the big banks are all in receipt of support from the Bank of England. And there's obviously huge amounts of money being made available in the form of loans, uh, huge injections of cash into the financial system. All these things are being done because, in order to stabilise capitalism, basically, in order to make sure that people who were wealthy before the crisis, businesses that existed before the crisis, banks that existed before the crisis, exist afterwards. And what happened when we saw that last time? was that, yes, the government did everything it could in the moment to save the people in whose interests it operates, um, which you know, then as now the British state has always been and will always to some extent favour 
the interests of big business, big finance, capital, et cetera. Um, and then as soon as that was over, we saw a Conservative government come to power, which imposed the costs of that on working people under the complete and utter lie that the idea that cutting public spending in the depression would um, stimulate the economy which obviously it didn't. It actually increased increased the burden of debt by um, reducing economic growth and constraining tax revenues, leaving us in a situation where we've had a decade of wage stagnation, a decade of productivity stagnation, um, and a really, you know, an economy basically that even before the coronavirus, coronavirus crisis was massively overburdened by debt, uh, private debt rather than actually government debt. So household debt and, and business debt, which is now creating very serious problems for the rest of the economy. Um, so, you know, the thing we can learn there is that the government is going to do everything it can to stabilise capitalism. The government is going to do everything it can to support the interests of its mates in the city of London. But as soon as they feel safe again, then suddenly it's all going to be about, right, who's going to pick up the town? And it is not going to be the people for whom uh, that state largesse was provided in the midst of this crisis. It's going to be working people. Now, you know, we don't know if there's going to be a full-throated return to austerity, because obviously uh, we, are, we have a different government now, which is a slightly different base in terms of who's elected it. But there will be cuts. And as in the wake of the financial crisis, the cuts will be imposed on the people least able to resist them on the people, the weakest portions of society, um, on the least organised portions of society, to those cuts when they come, to make sure that, uh, you know, when, you know, George Osborne's already said, the Chancellor's already said, we're going to have to pick up the tab for this afterwards. It's going to be our job to actually stand up and say, not only are you not going to impose the costs of this crisis on the people least able to bear them or working people up and down this country. We are going to use the recovery from this crisis to transform our economy and make sure that, you know, if something like this happens again, we are prepared. And to make sure actually that events like this do not become more frequent as the climate crisis uh, worsens. We're going to have to be there to campaign for a Green New Deal that allows us to rebuild our economy, make it fairer, more sustainable and more equitable over the long term. Um, and I think, you know, the one major lesson to finish on that we, we need to have from the, from the lessons of 2008 is that we have to be prepared. In the wake of that crisis, socialists all around the world said, oh, well, right, you know, obviously capitalism is over because of this massive crisis. This proves everything we've been saying for such a long time, but we weren't organised enough. We presumed that history was in our favour, so we didn't mobilise. We need to make sure that not only are we making these arguments, but that we're organised and mobilised to put them into practice. Thank you, Grace. Um, we're running out of time, so I'm going to ask the one more question and get Richard to come Coming on that, if that's OK. So one of the things that's really distinguished Jeremy Corbyn's leadership is his consistent opposition to wars and his support for an ethical foreign policy that promotes peace and diplomacy. How do we ensure that we continue to advocate for this kind of socialist internationalism in the party? Well, I think uh, political education is a very important part of that. So I think if we look back at things that we could have done better over the last five years. I think political education is something that we could have done better. I'm not blaming uh, anybody for that because of course we were fighting the establishment uh, left, right uh, and center. And so not everything we wish to achieve uh, was possible uh, in those five years. But I think we need to understand that you can't be a socialist unless you're an internationalist. We need to understand that what was distinctive about Jeremy's leadership and what is distinctive about Jeremy's politics is the anti-war internationalism uh, of it. I said during my deputy leadership campaign that I thought there were three pillars of Corbynism, first party democracy, second anti-war internationalism uh, and third uh, support uh, for uh, public ownership. And that's why I came up with this idea uh, of the peace pledge where every time uh, 
there was a proposal to take uh, military uh, action, then unless it had United Nations uh, support, uh, the Labour Party membership, uh, if it w wasn't a, a national, a genuine national emergency, uh, would get to vote on what they believe the Labour Party position should be on that. The Labour Party position as distinct from the position of the government or the Prime Minister. Under Jeremy's leadership, we managed that in relation to um, David Cameron's plan to bomb Syria, and I think that uh, set uh, an important precedent. And so, obviously, it doesn't appear uh, as if we're going to have uh, that arrangement in the party now, but we can continue to uh, argue for them. I think it's important uh, that people on Labour's left work with organisations like uh, Stop the War. And unfortunately, I think that the importance of arguing against war and against conflict is going to become more and more uh, important. We can see some of the things uh, being said uh, by Donald Trump uh, about China. And the reality uh, is that we could enter a situation uh, of an intensified, unfortunately, kind of idea of a new uh, Cold War. And you see the kind of anti China, anti-Chinese racism that is being deployed by right-wing forces in the United States of America. Obviously, that's for the purpose of distracting from the blame, uh, distracting the blame because it's nothing to do with China or Chinese people that the United uh, States hasn't sorted out its testing and go into lockdown quickly enough because it's nothing to do with China or Chinese people uh, that our government has made mistakes in relation uh, to delaying uh, a lockdown, not closing all non-essential workplaces and, get, and not following the World Health Organization when it comes to uh, testing, 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 uh, and of course, tracing. But I think in the atmosphere of what's forecasted as being uh, an economic crash, sadly, greater than the Great uh, Depression, I think we'll see competition more and more uh, between uh, the big powers internationally. The world is going to become a more and more dangerous place. The shadow of the threat of war uh, will be cast over all our lives. So the anti-war internationalism uh, is more uh, important uh, than uh, ever before. When it comes to the uh, anti-Chinese racism that we've all seen. It reminds me also of the Islamophobia, the anti-Muslim hatred that was whipped up by the establishment during and after the invasion uh, of Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, and obviously uh, the intervention in Libya as well, because all of these dehumanizations, all of this racist rhetoric, all of these dog whistles serve the purpose of, of softening the public up to support various policies, domestic and international, uh, by the establishment, whether it be in the United States, uh, the UK, uh, or anywhere else. So I say that all uh, left members of the Labour Party should ensure that we do all we can to ensure that the Labour Party remains an anti-war internationalist party. It's not a distraction. It's not an optional add-on. If you're not an internationalist, you're not a socialist. If you're not interested in the struggles of working class people in other countries around the world, then your socialism uh, isn't in the position it should be. So I think it's something that all of us really need to learn more about, including myself, because we learn each and every day, but it's something that as a movement, we need to understand that our commitment as a left to anti-war internationalism is totally, totally non-negotiable. And if people think we can't be for peace, we can't be against war, because it might cost us votes, that's wrong. That's absolutely wrong, and it's something which we cannot drop. It's a principle which is non-negotiable. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. And um, I think we're going to have to wrap up now because we are running out of time. So thank you for everyone for uh, participating. Of course, thank you to our fantastic panel, Ian Lavery MP, Grace Blakely and Richard Bergen MP. Uh, we know we have important battles ahead and also just how important our campaigning for people is for their health and for the planet and to put private and to put, put, put private for profit is right now and how essential it will be going forward. 
We must keep working together across the left, uh, the Labour and all progressive movements to insist there is no return to business as usual when it comes to our economy and politics. And to not only argue that a better world is possible, but to win that better world. And I believe we can do that. Uh, please note that we're also hosting an online May Day discussion uh, this Friday at 3 p.m. with Jeremy Corbyn, um, um, myself again, and some special international guests. You can sign up in advance on the Arise Facebook page and on Eventbrite. Um, as we won't be having a physical Arise Festival this summer, uh, this will be the first event in, in, of our virtual festivals over the next three months. So please keep an eye out for more details. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Stay home and stay safe.